wish I could tell you, wish I could describe it, I can't contain it, can't keep it to myself, the running of colors, to paint the whole picture, not enough words to ever say what I feel, wonderful and beautiful and glorious and holy, is merciful and powerful, who we talking about? That's my king. We declare the glory. Give him all the honor. All together worthy. Who we talking about? That's my king. There's no one before you. Yes, we will adore you. All of this is for you. Who we talking about? That's my king. Let the rocks cry without joining the chorus. There's not enough notes to make the harmony. It's a song of the ages, sing through the ages, all of the earth and heaven's symphony. Wonderful and beautiful and glorious and holy, he is merciful and powerful. Who we talking about? That's my king. Give you the glory. Give him all the honor. All together worthy. Who we talking about? That's my king. There's a one before you. Yes, we will adore you. All of this is for you. Who we talking about? That's my king. my king that's my god that's my shepherd my protector that's my king that's my rock and that's my anchor my defender that's my king that's my god that's my shepherd my protector that's my king, that's my rock, that's my anchor, my defender. That's my king, we declare the glory, give him all the honor, all together worthy. Who we talking about? That's my king, we declare the glory, give him all the honor, all together worthy. Who we talking about? That's my king. There's no one before you. Yes, we will adore you. All of this is for you. Who we talking about? That's my king. That's my king. Y'all ready to have revival in the River Valley this morning? Everybody get to the back of the van Down by the river there's an old church man Singing a song, clapping along We all gonna have a revival Muddy water gonna wash your sins Tell everybody to bring your friends Hold on tight, it might last all night We're gonna see a revival When that choir starts singing And that chorus rises That old preacher preaching Set souls on fire All day through the night We're gonna get back to the Bible Anybody lost wanna get saved Get found Come down the Big Ten Revival Come on down to the Big Ten Holy Ghost power gonna set you free It don't matter if it takes all week Fire from heaven falling down like a rain Ain't nobody here walking out the same Signs and wonders, trumpet sounds Riding out of here on a glory cloud Get out of your seats and get on your feet We are all about to have a revival When that choir starts singing And that chorus rises That old preacher preaching Set souls on fire All day through the night We're gonna get back to the Bible 
Everybody lost, wanna get saved, get found. Calm down, the Big Ten Revival. Everybody get to the back of the van Down by the river there's an old church band Singing a song, clapping along We all gonna have a revival tonight Why start singing tonight Chorus rises that old preacher preaching Said souls on fire All day through the night We gonna get back to the Bible Anybody lost wanna get saved, get found Come down, well, anybody lost, want to get saved, get found, come down, the Big Ten Revival, come on down to the Big Ten, everybody get down, to the whole town, everybody get down, to the Big Ten, everybody get down, to the whole town, everybody get down, to the Big Ten, everybody get down, Till the whole town, everybody get down to the Big Ten. Well, we had a special for you today. Our brother Ryan was going to sing this song. so, uh, But uh, some things have kind of happened. We want to keep him and his family in prayer, you guys, this morning. So I'm going to step in and try to do this for him, okay? I've had a dollar to my name. I've had friends that walked away. And I've even lost myself a time or two. There were bridges crossed and burned. But through all the wreckage I have learned. There is one thing that I could never lose If I got Jesus I've got all that I could ever need Take the world away from me And I'll be okay If I got Jesus there's a hope that's living deep inside And a joy that I could never hide And a safe place to fall If I got Jesus Oh, I've got it all I've seen weakness turn to strength I've seen failures met with grace And it's not from what I've done It's Christ in me A miracle I can't explain Oh, He's given me His name I'm the luckiest man That I could ever be If I got Jesus And a joy that I could never hide And a safe place to fall If I got Jesus Oh, I've got it all Someday that trumpet's gonna sound And the King of Heaven will ride upon the clouds coming down going home if I got Jesus I got all that I could ever need take the world away from me oh and I'll be okay if I got Jesus there's a hope that's living deep inside and a 
joy that I could never hide in a safe place to fall if I got Jesus oh I got it all if I got Jesus I got it all I'm aware of everything that's wrong with me I live with the past I can't get past And it still haunts me So I'm asking for the courage to make a change By your grace I've already paid every debt I owe. Please take my chance and make me see that by your grace I've been set free. Teach me, Lord, to seek you day by day. Let only you define just where I stand. Let me not take for granted all the depths of your forgiveness. Cause the only way I'm gonna be a better I've got a long way to go Oh, but Lord, I know There's not a step I'm gonna take But you're not with me I've got a long way to go Oh, but Lord, I know There's not a step I'm gonna take But you're not with me There's not a step I'm gonna take if you're not with me. You're always with me. And by your grace, I have hope. I have You've already paid every debt I owe. By your grace, I've been set free. By your grace, I've been set free.
Have you been set free by his grace today? Thank you, praise team, for leading us into an atmosphere of praise and worship. You may be seated. I'm going to be asking some of you to get up one more time before I turn the service to our speaker today. If you brought a guest with you today, I would like for you to stand and your family with you. Yes, go ahead. There's that part of the family. Here's this part of this family. Part of that, okay, here on the back seat. Man, we just, thank you so much for bringing your friends and people with you. If you are a family of the pastor, I would like for you to stand as well. If you're not ashamed of me, I won't be ashamed of you. <laughs> Thank you for coming and being here with us today. Thank you for everyone who asked your family to come. That tells me that you're not ashamed of them and they're not ashamed of you. So I know in family we have good, the bad, and the ugly, but God loves us all, amen? I don't know exactly where I fit into that, but I'm in there somewhere. I'm not going to take up a lot of our speaker's time because he drove a long way just to be with us today. And he went the long way around. He even went through Oklahoma to come way up that way. And he's driving a box car, a box truck, just in case that you wonder how he's getting around. He came yet driving in here yesterday in his workout clothes and a pair, and a pair of shorts and, and his muscle shirt. You know, he likes to show them off. And, uh, and he's driving that box car. I said, Randy, why are you driving that box truck? A box car, not a box, not a box car, a box truck. He said, well, I'm gonna back it up to the church where they can just pile the money in it. <laughs> I'll guarantee you, you will not get one thing on this guy. He will come back with something, but he is one of the most brilliant men that I've ever been around in my life. You look over here on my left, you'll see some of his artwork last night. I know that don't make any sense to you, but it made a lot of sense to us last night in our service. Brother Randy, he brought the word of God to us in teaching from the book of Daniel. And he's gonna be doing the same tonight. I don't know whether he's gonna be on the book of Daniel or not, but he'll be somewhere He's one of them Caldwell boys. He'll hit it somewhere. So it's my privilege to turn our service to Dr. Randy Caldwell. Give him a good round of applause as he comes today. Randy, God bless you. Renee, it's a privilege to have you with us as well. Kindly keep him under control if you can, okay? Good luck with that. Amen. Grace the Lord. Well, to God be all the glory, great things he has done. Amen. Thank you all for coming back from last night. I thought I'd cleaned house, so I appreciate you all coming back. Always a joy to be back home in the area here at Russellville, graduated from Pottsville High School, and um, uh, <clears throat> many of you, barely, barely okay. <laughs> Are we gonna start that? Is that what we're gonna do? All right. Just let me know what the rules are and we can all play the same game, but uh, anyway. Caldwells and the Finleys have known each other for a long, long, long time. And, and I look around and see all these uh, used to be babies, now carrying babies and grandbabies. And it lets me know that my wife is really getting old. And so, because <laughs> coming October, me and Miss Renee will be married 39 years. And uh, <clears throat> it was predicted we wouldn't make 39 days, but uh, we made it. I tell her after 39 years, I still wake up and see her sleeping every morning. And I think, wow, that is a lucky woman right there. <laughs> she asked me one time, she said, if I die, are you going to remarry? And I said, well, good Lord, I can't go to the funeral by myself. <laughs> so that's what she's put up with for a long time. But uh, anyway, we've been married 39 years. We've never had one argument in 39 years. We've had some loud discussions that lasted for weeks, but uh, we've never had an argument. <laughs> but anyway, so it's good to have them here. It's good to have my daughters here, my twin daughters. 
They're out with the grandbabies. You might have seen me holding uh, the youngest grandbaby that she has there. And uh, he's the next to the youngest of all the grandbabies. I have 11 grandchildren. And um, he don't want to turn Papa loose for anybody. And it's a great, great blessing. He was born when I was in Israel uh, last October uh, when the war broke out there in Israel. As I explained to you last night that I was there. And then on the 12th of October, he was born. If you know anything about history, King Cyrus, a Persian king, uh, was the one who decided that he wanted to rebuild the temple in Jerusalem. And so my son-in-law, while I was in Israel uh, at that time, and, and he was born, decided to name him Cyrus. And so his name is Cyrus, and his second name is Randall, my given name, so Cyrus Randall. So he just, he hangs on to me, and uh, he's going to be uh, an Israel supporter. I'll assure you that. I'm an Israel supporter. If you're not, uh, laid out the scenario last night. If you're not, you are theologically illiterate, you are evil, or you're misinformed, or you're just stupid. So, <laughs> some of you visual look at me and say, well, that don't sound like Jesus. We'll explain that last night. You should have been here last night. But uh, nonetheless, I'm gonna teach and preach to you this morning. It is family day. God ordained the family. And um, so, um, you just get ready. The way I feel right now, I was gonna tell people to get your Bibles, just open your Bibles and pick a scripture. I'm sure I'll be by there shortly. Uh, <clears throat> that's kinda how we're feeling right now. But um, as I was gonna say, it's just good to see everybody. My sister, uh, who is apparently leaving right now, and um, obviously easily offended. And um, <laughs> so, and those of you that know the Caldwell family, I'm the youngest boy, I am different. Uh, I live in Texas. I had to move out of the state uh, 20 years ago. They run me out, and uh, I've, I've not. That's, yeah, for stealing horses. Yeah, that's what it was. That's a joke. Okay. It's my wife that chimed in. Glad to have her this morning. We was pouring coffee on her. She was drunk last night, and uh, that's a joke also. <laughs> it's it's okay to laugh. It's fine. See, if you like traditional Pharisees, today's not your day. I think you ought to enjoy life. Smile. Make people laugh. Because joy is a good medicine. Laughter is a good medicine. Princeton University done a study and spent 10 million point, 10.3 million dollars over nine years and done a study and found out that people who laugh live longer. Really? It took you $10 million to figure that out? Man, you could have gave me one. I could have showed you scripture and proved that. <laughs> so thank you for being here. I have been informed uh, that my time is on a leash. I won't say who said that my time is on a leash, but her initials are CJ. And uh, so, uh, so as you know, she's, um, uh, we did graduate high school together and uh, we was in a, uh, same classes, and uh, Miss Payette, she was, uh, she said, and I believe she's passed away, I believe, and, uh, and they said that, uh, she said to me one day, she said, son, I have no idea where you're going in life, but it's somewhere, either well-known or prison, and uh, so thank the Lord, uh, it was not prison. So it's uh, good to see, uh, I said, my sister and my nephew Justin here, my daughters, my wife, um, Scott and Terry Madding on the back seat back there have been a part of our ministry for decades. As a matter of fact, Terry is my personal secretary this August of 26 years. And so it's, uh, it's astounding. I informed her a couple of years ago, if she goes to die, I'll kill her. <laughs> sure as a world. And then it's also good to have uh, dear, dear friends of ours, Joe and Vicki Qualls also drove over from Oklahoma um, this morning and surprise us and so it's just uh, good to see them. Get your Bibles out if you would and go over to the book of Proverbs. I'm going to um, I'm preach a little bit this morning and um, if you're here today and you don't know Jesus, I've got good news for you. He's wanting to get to know you. Amen. And here's the deal. You may not believe this, but Jesus Christ, who was born of a virgin, lived 33 and a half years on this planet, died, resurrected, and ascended up into the sky. And he's coming back. Really? No joke. Really, he is. 
whether you're ready or not, he's coming. And he's got a day set, God does, and he's coming back. And uh, I believe there's gonna be a resurrection. I believe there's gonna be a rapture. People say, well, I don't believe in rapture. Well, that's fine, we're not talking to you. This is not your part of the service. You know? And um, I believe there's gonna be a rapture. Somebody said, you pre-tribulation, you mid-tribulation, you post-tribulation. You pre-trib, mid-trib, or post-trib. I don't give a rip-trib, I couldn't care less. I won't argue with you about it. Now, I'm not here to offend you uh, with my antics. Uh, some people sometimes can get upset at my antics because I like to joke and cut up. I like to have a good time. I see everything funny. It just makes me laugh. I just, if you ever get to feeling bad about yourself, just wait for the next county fair. Go down there and look around. Boy, your self-esteem will shoot right up. And <laughs> it's just, see some of y'all looking like, what? Yeah, that's just the way it's going to go today. So just hold on. And um, so nonetheless, I think you ought to have a good time. I was 34 years of age before I ever saw a painting, a rendering of Jesus Christ smiling. 34. I kept it. I kept it. Still got it. Picture of Jesus smiling. I grew up all my life, never saw a picture of Jesus smiling. Everyone I saw, he looked like he's mad and ticked off and in horrible pain and, and just and great. He did go through agony. But Jesus had a good time. He was full of life and joy. You know how I know? Little kids hung out with him. See, you can fool your spouse, you can fool your boss, you can fool people in your family. You ain't fooling them kids. Them kids got a sense about them. They don't hang with some old sour or something in the church. They don't hang out with them. They hang around that old man that's always smiling, got candy in his pocket. Man, so you find little kids hanging out with somebody, just know that person's probably a good, pretty good person. Out in the foyer, we have some items out there if you'd like to stop and bless the nation of Israel. Uh, thank God for the news yesterday that the Israel Defense Force, the IDF, went in and killed more terrorists and, and uh, rescued four living hostages that was taken over eight months ago, man. <clears throat> now, thank God for it. I was there when the war broke out, and in 48 hours, the military took me down to Gaza. I was out of Gaza, and I saw the carnage. I saw it myself, things I will never forget. And I uh, won't get into it today, but um, Israel is going to make it. I've got my doubts about this country, but Israel's going to make it. I believe America will make it if we stand with Israel. If not, we're done. You hear me? You need a passport to go from Arkansas to Missouri, people are going to wish they listened. Okay? And it's coming. It's coming. I'm not an internet conspiracy theorist. I just go with the word of God. And uh, so I love to bless Israel. Now, the um, <clears throat> Standard Bank in England, uh, Wednesday, I guess it was, started on Wednesday and then Thursday, has actually tagged Randy Caldwell Ministries as a combatant against Palestine. Um, they've just, uh, <laughs> that's quite a blessing. <laughs> Amen. So we're looking for another way to get money to Israel. Uh, when the war broke out, I tried to get online and thought I'd raise $25,000, 30000 and everything combined together, we have given now over $800,000 uh, to the nation of Israel. And it's astounding. It's astounding. So if you want to bless the nation of Israel, there's things out there. There's, there's jewelry from the shops and different tallits and different things out there. I'm not in a bind. I'm not hawking jewelry. It's just all out there. And that blesses the nation of Israel. Uh, I want you, if you would, to turn your Bibles to the book of Proverbs. Today is family day, and I want you to listen to me. It is ordained of God. There is a plan that is afoot in this nation to literally dismantle the family. This so-called transgender movement, look at me, is demonic. Well, that offends me. So, that cracks me up. Now, I'm offended, but I don't care. Why would I care if you're offended? So if I do something offensive, that's between me and God. If you get offended, baby, that's on you. That's true. That's true. Yeah. So people say, I'm offended. I literally had a guy stand in one of our meetings. It was a question and answer session. Well, I was a little bit offended. I said, well, where do we go from here? Let's analyze that. You're offended. Now what? Yeah. I've got to change the way I conduct my life because your parents raised a sissy? I don't want to tell you. Hang on, this is how this is gonna to roll today, all right? 
It's just an hour you can get through it. Hold on, you can do it. You're an adult. It's time to speak up. The pronoun crowd. We, us, they, and them. Let me give you some information. Those four pronouns, we, us, they, and them, are the only four pronouns that demons use in the Bible to conduct and call themselves. Demons never call themselves in the word of God, he or she. It's always we, us, they, or them. So you better pay attention. Light bulbs just came on all over the building. Now I saw the building get brighter. <clears throat> the devil is out to destroy the family. You better wake up. I want to read to you in Proverbs chapter number 18 in one verse of scripture. The name of the Lord is a strong tower. You can stand up. Some don't want to, that's fine. I'm not going to force you. Proverbs 18 and verse number 10. The name of the Lord is a strong tower. And the righteous, the rightness, those that desire to be right, run into it and they're safe. The name of the Lord's a strong tower. A strong tower, what is that? That's, a, that's like, a, um, like a castle. It's like a place of refuge. And this is not a physical place. This is a spiritual place that just the name of God alone is a strong tower. Just the name of God is a place of safety. And those that want to be right, those that are righteous, that's what that means, rightness, can run to the name of God and everything that the enemy had planned has to be canceled and blessings rescheduled in its place instead because when you want to be right and you go to the name of God, you can be safe there. So I want to talk to you today about the name of God. Grab yourself a seat. The name of the Lord is a strong tower and they that want to be right can run into it. Now, years ago, um, uh, when, I was at, when we first started going to Israel, me and my wife, we've been going uh, now for about 30 years and best I can count. I'm going back. I was there in October. I was there in December. I was there in February, going back the end of this month. And um, uh, the best I can figure, this will be trip number 51 or 52 of the times that I've been to Israel. But one of the first times that I ever went to Israel, we were uh, preparing and the kids were just young. It's 30 years ago, actually. And, uh, and, and, and my wife here, her brother, her brother, Eddie, uh, actually died. And uh, Eddie was not a, uh, he was not a, he was not a, a, a good guy. He, he wanted to be right, but he just, he just couldn't do it. He, he had drug problems and, and uh, he just would fall off the wagon. And I literally saw him at times would literally get right with God go to jail, and then he would ask for a Bible. He'd get dried out, start reading the Bible, and lead people to the Lord in jail. <laughs> and then get out and fall off the way. I couldn't understand that for the life of me. I just couldn't figure it out. And so I was the only preacher her family knew, and Eddie passed away at the age of 39, had an aneurysm in the mercy of God. We were down in Louisiana, and they came to me and, and said, you got a phone call. I went to the phone, and they said, Eddie is dying, and he's got about two hours. I went to my wife, and I told her, and I said, and I walked in, she said, what's wrong, baby? And I said, I need to talk to you. He said, the kids know what is it? And she said, well, I, 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 I said, it's Eddie, he's dying. And she looked at me, and she said, no. And I said, well, baby, I don't know what to tell you. Uh, the man's had an aneurysm. They said he's gonna live for about two hours. And she stomped her foot and said, I said, no. God promised me my family and he will not die until you get to him. And I said, yes, ma'am. <laughs> and, uh, and so we uh, went and dropped her off and the medics came and picked her up at Hope, Arkansas and went to the hospital. I finished revival, got home on Thursday. He's still alive. and. And we got ready to leave on Saturday, he's still in a coma, and we go and come back, and he's still in a coma, go two weeks, and we come back, and it was on a Tuesday, I think, and we were there, uh, and just uh, Brother Dennis Pigman sitting in the uh, waiting room, and Eddie just came out of a coma. And uh, his daughters were there, and we got to go in, and they did, and see him, and, and visit with him, and, and, and prayed with him, and he lifted his hands, and he cried, and asked God to forgive him, and 30 minutes later, went back in a coma, and an hour later, and died. <laughs> well, uh, they asked me to preach a funeral. I'm up. I'm the only preacher they know. Well, I know that. Listen, listen. It, it, I'm, I've been me for a long time. And I thought, well, I ain't going to cover this up. So I got up to preach. 
Dean Peggy come to help me. They sang and I got up and I read the scripture. They that hunger and thirst after righteousness shall be filled. Look, the Bible don't say they that are righteous shall be filled. It says they that hunger and thirst after righteousness. Those that hunger and thirst to be right shall be filled. God didn't say you had to be right for him to get to you. He said you had to want to be right. That, that's what he said. And so I just stood up and read that scripture, they that hunger and thirst after rightness shall be filled. And I started off and I said, if you're here today, and the building was packed, but Jim and I said, if you're here today looking for me to tell you what a good man Eddie Bass was, you're gonna be disappointed because he wasn't a good guy. He was just, a, he was a thief. He's still from, are y'all with me right now? <laughs> that, no, you don't want me preaching your funeral, I'll assure you that. And I said he wasn't a good man. And I went for about two minutes and told just how sorry of a life that he'd actually lived. And then I said, the only good thing that I know that happened in his 39 years of miserable existence happened in the last two weeks. It's called the mercy of God. And I just cut loose preaching. <laughs> and I gave an altar call and six people came and knelt in front of the casket and gave their heart and life to God. See, the bottom line is, are we winning people into the family of God? You have to understand that. Now, here's what I'm seeing in, in, in today's society, especially in the church world. People are not looking for answers, but they're looking for pity and they're looking for sympathy. Now, that's fine. God bless you. I'm not known for my compassion, okay? I'm not known for my sympathy. I think you just need to suck it up, but a cup and be a man, be a woman, and let's just move on. That's kind of the way I see things. And people ask me, Dr. Caldwell, can I come and have two hours of your time to counsel with you? Well, no, I'm busy. Uh, you can't, but what's your problem? Well, here's my problem. Well, are you sorry you done it? Yeah, do you ask the Lord to forgive you? Yeah, well then, let's move on. Stop, don't do it no more, let's just move on. That, that's how I kind of see it. Well, you may not see it that way, but that's kind of how I am. But see, I've learned that if you're looking for sympathy, I can't help you. But if you're looking for answers, I've got something that can help you, amen? I've got something called the Word of God. As I said last night, it is not a cliche. It's not just a church statement in this Bible right here Everything that you will ever want to know, everything, every question that you've ever got, that's tonight's sermon, amen? Uh, everything that, that you ever want to know about truth is inside the word of God. Now, I want you to listen to me. Thank you, sir. You are a scholar and a gentleman. There's very few of us left. Uh, you need to understand that everything that you need is in the word of God. Now, if you study, the Bible says study to show yourself approved, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Several years ago when I began to study the biblical Hebrew, I learned something really strange. Is a lot of scriptures that we quote and a lot of things that we say or don't mean exactly what, I, I love this one here. They love to say, well the Bible says, obey the laws of the land. You have no idea how relieved I was to find out that ain't in the Bible. Because <laughs> see, I speed, I, I, the way I drive. I, I drive fast, I break the law every time I get in the car. That's just how it is. And I know you're so, you're so holy, straight in your halo, but I speed, I drive fast because I'm always in a hurry. If you're not in a hurry, there's demons that are sent to buffet me every day. And they're usually in the left-hand lane doing 55 mile an hour. Get yourself, get over. Some of us are in a hurry. Well, if you go five mile an hour over the speed limit, your guardian angel gets out. Number one, that ain't true. And number two, if it was true, he might as well not even get in with me because I'm doing that by the time I get to the end of the on-ramp. <laughs> oh, y'all so spiritual, amen. Well, you're gonna, no, listen, I've got a guardian angel and my guardian angel is stuck to my windshield with two suction cups. <laughs> and every time a radar goes off, I hit the brake. <laughs> and it's protected me for many, many, oh, y'all so spiritual, amen. Hey, let's dig in your clothes and see what you're hiding, all right? So, so understand, I, I, I was so thrilled to find out that that's two scriptures that people merged together to make it fit their little agenda. And so it, it says, you know, it's about those that rule over you and the ordinances and I won't get into that. Well, there's one scripture that I read and I wanna break it down for you to show you something before I get into the meat of this message of the name of the Lord. So you need to understand that you are a part of a family unit and you need to, sir, and it's very difficult especially if you and your wife have had a discussion that got kind of loud, it's very difficult to take your family by the hand and pray. 
I got it. <laughs> I understand, okay? It's very difficult for you to take your wife or your husband by the hand and just pray. You know, look here. I said, until the other day, a lady was praying. She said, Lord, I know that it says that it's better for a man to dwell on the rooftop or in the desert than it is with a bickering woman. What I need to know, Lord, was that just any desert or was there a specific one I need to take it? <laughs> so, so I understand that, okay? I do understand that situation. But, but understand, if you will use the word of God in your family, I promise you, the presence of God will be in your family and in your home. The devil, listen to me, is out to destroy unity. There is nothing that terrifies Satan any more than people using the word of God to be in unity. He's terrified of it. As a matter of fact, you cannot find anywhere in the Bible that Satan ever, you don't even insinuate it, that Satan ever attacked Adam before there was unity between the man and the woman. He didn't start attacking <laughs> until there was unity. And so you have to understand that Satan is terrified of unity. So if you learn, watch me, if you learn to read the word of God and bring your family into the understanding, yes, it's tough. You don't have to expound the word of God like like myself or maybe my brother Dean, who's an astounding minister, that my brother's Bill, you don't have to expound the word of God like that. Just read it and get it on the inside of you. As a matter of fact, I gave you a scripture, Proverbs 25 and verse two. I want you just to throw that up there because I want to show you something. Uh, it's Proverbs, if you want to pick up your Bible and read it, Proverbs chapter 25 and verse number two says, uh, no, that's Proverbs, <laughs> chapter 25 and verse number two. It, it literally says in, in, in chapter 25, is it up there? Because I want you to see it. Uh, and verse number two, it says, it is the glory of God to conceal a thing, but it is the honor of kings to search out a matter. Now that verse, watch this guys, that don't mean a lot to you until you begin to break it down in the Hebrew and understand what the Hebrew actually means. Solomon wrote this and he said, it is the glory of God to conceal a thing, but it's the honor of kings to search out a matter. Now when that was translated into English, the word glory and the word honor are actually the same word in the Hebrew. And it's the word kabod, K-A-B-O-D. And it literally means the splendor, the reputation, or the benefit of. Now why the translators translated kabod in the first part of the verse to glory? And the second part to honor, I don't know, but the word is kabod and it means the splendor, the reputation, and the benefit of. So if you read the verse now, it says it's the splendor of the reputation and the benefit of God to conceal a thing, but it's the splendor of the reputation and the benefit of kings to go search out a matter. Now that don't mean a lot yet, but when you understand the word thing and the word matter just so happens to also be the same word and it's devour or devour in the modern Hebrew. And it means a word inside of a word. So when you read that and understand that those four words are actually two words, it says it's the splendor of the reputation and the benefit of God to conceal a word in a word. But it's the splendor of the reputation and the benefit of kings to go search out the word that he put in the word. Now the word conceal is the Hebrew word psalmic kol resh, and it means to hide with the intent of provoking someone to seek at the proper time for it to be revealed. That's what that one word means, psalmic kol resh. So now the verse reads like this. It's the splendor, the reputation, and the benefit of God to hide with the intent of provoking someone to seek for it to be revealed at the proper time a word that he put in the word. But it is the reputation, the splendor, and the benefit of kings to go search out the word that he put in the word. Now the word kings, <laughs> I hate to bore you with this, but the word kings is melek. The root word is malek. And the word malek doesn't mean rain king, it means those who's been appointed to reign in the future. So when Solomon wrote that, he said, it's the splendor, the reputation, and the benefit of God 
to hide with the intent of provoking someone to seek at the proper time for it to be revealed the word that he hid inside of the word. But it is the splendor, the reputation, and the benefit of those who's been appointed to reign in the future to go search out the word that he put in the word. Hallelujah. So what are you saying, preacher? I'm saying to you that every answer that you need is in the word of God. And every promise that you find in the word of God now belongs to you. God gave it to Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and the Jewish people in the Old Testament. And by the way, if you're a New Testament only Christian, you've lost your ever loving mind because the New Testament has no legitimacy and it does not even have any meaning without the Old Testament. So therefore, when you take the old and combine with the new, you can go to Galatians 3 and 29 and he says that we are now the seed of Abraham. So every time you read a promise to Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Israel, Jerusalem, you can add a me too on that. So if you're going through trouble in your family, he said, I'll bless you when you come in and I'll bless you when you go out. That's me. Well, I'll bless you in the city. I'll bless you in the field. I'll take some of that. I'll bless you when you rise up. I'll bless you when you lay down. Give me some of that. Those that curse you, I'll curse them. Those that bless you, I'll bless them. Put me some of that. I'm here to tell you today that the devil is out to destroy your mind. He's out to destroy your family and your praise and worship don't get rid of the enemy. Your shouting don't get rid of the enemy. And thank God for it. But went before God's presence and literally uh, the devil rather went before God's presence and talked about Job. If the presence of God gets rid of Satan, how in the world could Satan go before God? Jesus was in the wilderness for 40 days and 40 nights and Lucifer was there. Being with Jesus for a month and a half ought to put you in the presence of God. The presence of God, the singing, the praying does not get rid of the devil. What does? In Matthew chapter 4 and verse 10 and verse number 11, Jesus quoted a scripture the third time and said it is written and the Bible says that Satan left him and angels came and ministered. It's not your singing it's not your shouting, it's not your praying, it's not your preaching, it's not your talking in tongues, yet it gets rid of the enemy. It is the word of God and if you'll get it the devil has got to go. Somebody give him praise and honor in here today. It's the word of God. Okay I'm back. Told myself I wasn't gonna do that, but sometimes I have to, amen? It's the word of God that changes. And Jesus said in the last day, there'll be a famine, you know the scripture, not for bread and water, but for the word of God. Honey, we're there. I know people don't know split beans from coffee about the word of God. So where do you start? Start with Genesis. That's a good one. I first started preaching. I want to know about prophecy. So I started studying the book of Revelation. About two years into it, as a young minister back in the 80s, and I decided and figured out that about 85 to 90% of everything in the book of Revelation was going to take place, and I wasn't even planning on being here. So I thought, well, we'll just start back at the beginning. And 40 years ago, I went to Genesis chapter number one, and I started studying to fully understand it. And after 40 years, 42 years to be exact, I think I have a decent understanding of Genesis 1 and 1 through Genesis 5 and verse 21. That's where I'm at. Genesis 1 and 1, throw that one on the screen. Bible says, in the beginning. No, 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 you think you know this, hold on. Look here, I got a Genesis series that I taught 24 years ago it's called Genesis in the beginning. Some of y'all probably got it. And it's four and a half hours of me teaching Genesis chapter one, 31 verses. Four and a half hours. Now, those of you who were here last night understand that's a big possibility, okay? Four, four. I got my briefcase here. I brought a snack. I've heard me preach before. Look here. Pastor John Hagee, you don't know who John Hagee is? He's got a little struggling ministry down in San Antonio. And uh, he told me last year, son, you need to reteach Genesis chapter one. You're 20 years into it, you need to reteach that, 31 verses of chapter one. I started putting it together on our Zarephath network to teach last year. I'm at verse 26. We are at 16 and a half hours. 
Is there that much in there? Yeah. See verse 1? You know what that says? It says, Berashit bara elohim er chashimayim vayet vaharetz. Vayet vaharetz vavu vavohu. In the beginning, created God's, what it says in the Hebrew. I wasn't speaking in tongues, by the way, in case you don't understand. Berashit, in the beginning, bara, created, elohim, God, et. Berashit bara elohim et chashimayim vayet vaharetz. In the beginning, created God the heavens and the earth. Seven words in the Hebrew in that one verse. Take that verse out of the Bible because it stands alone. If you don't get past that one verse right there, you might as well not read any more of the word of God because everything hinges on that. Well, now, preacher, scientists believe they have proven that the universe began with the Big Bang. Well, great. Look at me, great. I don't have a problem in the world with a big bang. Not a problem in the world. But whenever it went bang, God done it. Okay, really, I'm not gonna talk about what he, how he done it. It just says he done it. Now I know there's a lot of church folk. Now, now any, any Pharisees in here, take a deep breath. Heads up, this one's gonna sting. Most church folk think that planet Earth is only 6,000 years old. That's ludicrous. This earth is not 6,000 years old. This earth is millions and millions and millions of years old. The sun and the moon of our solar system are only 6,000 years old because Genesis 1 and verse 14 says so. But when you look at 13 methodical steps of creation, in Genesis chapter number one, you look at 13 steps in six days of Genesis chapter one, he methodically went through everything from light to air dry ground and seed, sun and moon of our solar system, fish and fowl, beast and man and rest. Six days of creation, seven day rest, 13 steps of creation. He methodically called out everything from light to air and not one time did he say, let there be water. But before he said, let there be light, the Bible says that darkness was upon the face of the deep and the spirit of God moved upon the face of the water, whoop, look what we run into here. And then God said that to be light. Now who wrote that? Moses did. 2,000 years after the fact. So how in the world and what are the chances that one man could write about an event 2,000 years after it happened and get it right? Well, Dr. Peter Stoner, a mathematician, and I, if you were here last night, I enjoy numbers and math. It's just kind of my thing. I, just, I love numbers. I love them because they don't lie. Because well, they're manipulating numbers. You can't manipulate numbers. You can manipulate equations, but you can't manipulate numbers. You got two items, and you add two more items. You got four items, and that's it. It'll never change. You got five atoms, items and take away three, you're back at two. Now words, that's another thing. They change all the time. They always add them, giving them new definitions. See, when I grew up, a keyboard was on a piano, not a computer. When I grew up, a mouse was a rodent. <laughs> Log on is what you done to the wood stove. The web was where spiders hung out. Hard drive was a long trip in a car. <laughs> Microchips was actually in the bottom of a potato chip bag. <laughs> so things have kind of changed. But six and six was 12 and bless God, it's still 12. So I like it. Dr. Peter Stoner done some figuring and figured out what it would take, what are the chances of one man writing about an event 2,000 years, not the Torah, not the book of Genesis, just chapter one. And Dr. Peter Stoner figured out that for Moses to write Genesis chapter one to get it right, the chances was one to 32 sectillion. That's 32 comma and 21 zeros. That's a, that's a big number right there. That's bigger than the national deficit, which is quite a number within itself. <laughs> so, 
How much is 32 sectillion? Well, we're gonna print 32 sectillion lottery tickets, okay? And uh, to print that many tickets, we're gonna need eight million printing presses, printing 2,000 tickets a minute for five million years. And after five million years, of eight million printing presses, printing 2,000 tickets a minute, Moses got one shot to draw the winning ticket. And he done it. Whew. I like them kind of odds. And if I work with them kind of odds, when they build like a casino, I'm gonna go to it. <laughs> well, I lost my Pharisees, didn't I? <laughs> now, watch. See, Moses got it right. So you think maybe the hand of God is afoot. They lost it. No, didn't get it. Okay, watch. It's a joke, Pharisee. Laugh. All right, watch. So understand that Genesis 1 and 1, in the beginning. That's it. Put it back on there. The first word, in the beginning, is a Hebrew word, bedashit. And it's spelled... Bet, Resh, Aleph, Shin, Yud, Tav. Six letters. The first word of the Bible, Berashit in the Hebrew, which is the language of God. The word Bet, the letter Bet, in Berashit, in, in the beginning, is actually before they had the written language, they had a pictorial language, alphabet. And the Bet was like a floor pan but a bet is shaped like this. So you read Hebrew from right to left. So therefore, it is open going out, which means you're actually leaving the floor plate. You're leaving the house. The second letter is resh. The picture for resh is head, strong leader. But bet resh spells bar, which is son. So the first two letters of a six letter word in the first word in the alphabet says out of the house comes the son of the father. (laughs) The third letter is Aleph, which is a silent letter and it is the letter of God and it means strong mighty. But Bet Resh Aleph spells head. So the first three letters of the first word of the Bible says out of the house comes the son of the father who is strong and mighty. The fourth letter is Shin, which means to destroy and to tear down. The, the fifth letter is Yud, which is the smallest letter of the Hebrew alphabet. And the picture for Yud was an arm with an elbow, a forearm and a wrist, and a hand like a stick man with a nail driven in the wrist. That was a sign of Yud before the written alphabet. And the last letter is Tav. Oddly enough, Aleph, Shin, Yud spells thorns. The third, fourth, and fifth letter spells thorns. And the last letter is Tav, which was a cross. So the first word in the Bible says, out of the house of the Father comes a son who's strong and mighty to destroy with thorns a wounded hand on a cross. How can that not make you want to be saved? Belashit, but ah, Elohimet, Hashemim. In the beginning, created God. Now look, if you, I don't care what you, some of y'all sitting looking, well, I don't know about all this. You know, the science and the Bible contradict. That's what they told me when I grew up in this state. Well, how stupid is that? Science and the Bible cannot contradict. They do not contradict. Science is created of God. The Bible is the word of God. Science in the Bible cannot contradict. Scientists and preachers contradict. <laughs> and I've learned right there that, well, can't say that, some of y'all get really hurt, you got your feelings hurt. I've usually found that usually that scientist and preacher that's arguing back and forth, ain't neither one of them know what they're talking about. Amen? Good stuff. And God said, let there be or light. Can, can, do you, you have verse uh, two and three? Can, can you throw it up there? Are y'all bored? Because I'm not. 
And uh, thank you much. I appreciate it. Uh, right over here. I'm watching you. Uh, in the beginning, created God, the heavens and the earth. The earth was without form and void and darkness on the face of the deep. The spirit of God moved on these waters and God said, let there be light. Verse number three. And then verse four says, let there be light. And there was light. But watch verse four. It says, and God saw the light. I see it changes here in the Hebrew. Now, can I bore y'all with some Hebrew just a minute? See, remember when I said, better sheep, but Elohim, at Hashemim? See, there's seven words in that first verse, and only six of them have been translated. The word right in the middle is et, Aleph Tav, et. Y'all remark, so you understand et? It means you already had supper, right? <laughs> Come on, all right? Don't stay with me. Don't get, don't get all bent out of shape, all right? See, et is E-T, okay? Not in phone home, but, but it just, <laughs> welcome to my brain. See, watch. Et has never been translated because it's Aleph Tav. Aleph Tav, if you're reading it this way. Aleph Tav. And it's the first and the last letter of the Hebrew alphabet, which literally means that if you're going to translate that word, you have to write down everything that God has ever done, everything he's ever promised to do, everything he's going to do, and everything he is doing. So et cannot be translated. So when you get to verse three, it says, and God said, let there be light, and there was light. But verse four says, and God saw the light. It is stuck right there after the word light. Now, oh, this, can I teach just a minute? I, I, I feel like scratching. I've been, now when I'm teaching, I'm not going, ah, ah, ah. Okay, now if you need the, huh, I can bring it right back if you need it. Y'all good? Okay. <laughs> See, watch. In John chapter one and verse one through four, let me show you something. Can I teach y'all something? <laughs> Say amen, oh me, cuss, do something. Let me know you're here for crying out loud. Okay, can't believe the preacher said cuss. You're the Pharisee, I'm trying to get free, so stop. In John chapter one, verse one through four is some of the most prof prolific writings in human history. Because John says in the beginning, which is the same. You have to understand that John is talking about the same beginning that Moses is talking about. And Moses said in the beginning, in the beginning God created heaven and earth. In the beginning was light, air, dry ground seed, sun, moon, fish, fowl, beast, man, rest. Moses said in the beginning. John said in the beginning. And that's the only two places in the Bible where you find that phrase, in the beginning. So therefore, John is talking about Moses' beginning. But the difference between John, <laughs> the difference between John's in the beginning and Moses in the beginning is Moses followed his in the beginning with what happened after the beginning began. But John followed his in the beginning with what was before the beginning began because before the beginning began, he had already begun. <laughs> I need a nap. <laughs> and if you understand the Greek, and I know you do because you've been born and raised here and graduated from Pottsville. In Greek, Latin, and Hebrew, there's such a thing as a negative verb. There is no negative verbs in English, and a negative verb does not have negative connotation. A negative verb after any phrase in the Greek means what I'm about to say happened before what I just said. So if I filled up that wall over there with handwriting and got down here at the bottom of the baptistry and put a negative verb, it means what I'm gonna write the rest here happened before that whole wall of what I just said. So when John said in the beginning, light, air, dry ground, seed, sun, moon, fish, fowl, beast, man, rest. John said, in the beginning was, and that's a negative verb. So what John says is, you know what Moses told you? He done a good job there, but I'm not gonna cover it because he covered it well. I'm gonna tell you, in the beginning, negative verb, was. 
the word. Before all of that that Moses said was the word. But better yet, there's another negative verb. And the word was with God. But yet there's another negative verb. And the word was God. But then John said in verse two, and when the beginning began, the same that was before the beginning began, the same was in the beginning. Oh, Lord have mercy. <laughs> Get her done. <laughs> If you would just read the Bible every now and then, I've got anger issues, I really do. I could snap any minute. Watch. John said in the beginning, watch, was the Word. But now before he was the Word, he was with God. But before he was with God, he actually was God. But the same that was, <laughs> with God, it was God, when the beginning began, the same was in the beginning. You want to talk about family on family day? That right there, I'll wrap it up for you. See, what you have to understand is the law of sowing and reaping. It's not just about money. It's, it's, a, it's not a church law. It's not, it's, it's not a Christian law. The law of sowing and reaping is a God law. And it doesn't matter whether you're a saint or a sinner, you are gonna reap what you sow. You can't drink a fifth of whiskey every day for 55 years and be laid up in the hospital with liver problems and going, that old devil gave me a liver problem. No, he didn't. You done that, goober, you done that. You can't smoke five packs of cigarettes every day lay up in the hospital after 60 years of smoking five packs, dying of lung cancer, say the devil done. The devil didn't do that. Says on the package, it's gonna kill you, idiot. Read the package. <laughs> Crying out loud. <laughs> Y'all have to love me to go to heaven. Raise your hand if you love me. I wanna see who's going to hell. Okay, raise your hand. See, watch. See, watch, look here. In the beginning was the word. So John says, in the beginning was the word, before he was the word, he was with God, and before he was with God, he was God. But the same was in the beginning. And in John chapter eight, Jesus said, I am the light of the world. And the Pharisees got mad at him. You know why? Because they're standing outside. Now you can preach nine ways a Sunday about the spiritual application of light, but the actual literal translation is Jesus said, I'm the daylight. Now why in the world would you do that, Jesus? You know good and well, you, they're mad at you already and, you just, and you're just ticking them off. One of Jesus' favorite things to do was pick on church people. He started when he was 12. <laughs> in the church, messing with the preachers. Jesus loved to pick on church. And ever since I found that out years ago, it's been my life goal to be Christ-like. <laughs> laugh, you hypocrite, laugh. It's funny, laugh. <laughs> See what? <laughs> Jesus said, I'm the daylight. Now, why would Jesus say, I'm the daylight? If you go back to Genesis 1, you'll find out that the sun and moon of our solar system is in verse 14 through verse 18, but verse 19 says, in the evening and the morning were the fourth day, which means that God did not create the sun of our solar system until the end of day four. But the first thing he said was let there be light. And there was light. So where did the light come from? Well, in the beginning was the Word. And see, before Jesus was Jesus, he was the Word. Y'all not even, y'all, y'all, y'all took a nap. See, before Jesus was Jesus, he was the Word. And see, words are seeds. What you say, you can have. Oh, y'all not even with me right now. See, that's why it's important that you don't talk bad about yourself. Now, people say, oh, they're arrogant. They're conceited. No, it's called walking in faith. Because what you say, you can have. See, I know a preacher in this very state when I was a young preacher in Whitehall. We sat down in the Sunday school room back down there, and I was Dean's youth pastor. I'm 20, he's 28. It's a miracle anybody survived that. Okay? And I'm sitting with this preacher that I really, I really uh, revered. I thought he was really something. And I found out that day he was a jerk. Because he said to me, what do you think God's taking you? 
And I said, oh God, I almost called his name. Help me, Jesus. Because he's still pastors in this state. <laughs> Amen. Come to me after church and I'll tell you. Um, he said, what do you think God's doing with you, son? I said, well, I'm glad you asked. I believe that God is calling me to speak to leaders. Now, I'm just 20 years old. He said, what do you mean? I said, I don't know, maybe the city council here in town or, or the mayor or maybe state officials. I don't know. I love him. I said, maybe governors or, I said, shoot, senators and congressmen and presidents and prime ministers. He said, you little arrogant jerk. So he said to me, I said, what? He said, you're a good little preacher. If you'll get that pipe dream out of your head, who knows, you could pastor a church right here in Arkansas running maybe 200 or 250 people. Then I realized I was casting my pearls before swine. And I made a mental note of that preacher and stuck it right there in my spiritual pocket and have never had another conversation to him with him to this day. You holding a grudge. No, I'm forgiving. I'm just unforgetting. Bible says forgive and forget. No, it don't. It says forgive. You forget, you a fool. <laughs> Whew. Somebody help me right now. <laughs> See, watch. Your pastor knows, my family knows. That was 40 years ago. I can pick up this phone right here and open it up and call any Christian television station I want to in America, and they'll actually answer. I can call ministries like Pastor Hagee, Jensen Franklin, Paula White. I can call Benny Hinn. I can call Perry Stone. I can call presidents and prime ministers right here out of this phone. And Congress talked to three senators on the way here two days ago. See, what I said back then is happening now. But if I would have let somebody convince me of what God had told me, what, oh, you're not even here right now. Look here. <laughs> I didn't ask you to help me preach. I said, y'all not here. Drives me around the bend. The preacher says, help me preach. I don't want to help you preach. I come to listen to you. If I need help, I'll do it myself. <laughs> see, watch. What you say about you. See, Jesus said to the disciples at Caesarea Philippi, who do men say I am? And they said, some say, you're John the Baptist. Some say Jeremiah won the prophet. But then Jesus said, that's great. But what do you say? See, what some say don't have to affect you. But what you say makes all the difference in the world. Because there's power in your words. And when God, you can't find anything past Genesis chapter number two where God done anything except speak. Well, I'm not God. <laughs> well, that's fine. I can buy that. I've talked to you. Okay? Okay. But the spirit of Christ lives in you. The same spirit that was in him now dwells inside of you. And he said, these things and greater shall you do. If you just release your faith. Look here, look here, look, 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 look. Do you know what is the hindrance of faith? So doubt, no, no, doubt, <laughs> no. Doubt's the obstacle of faith. Well, fear, no, fear is the opposite of faith. The hindrance to faith is actually sight. Faith is the subject of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. And if you let what you see talk to you instead of your faith, you will never come. I'm preaching good stuff this morning. You've got to believe it yourself. So when Jesus said, I'm the daylight, the Pharisees got mad, but he had a right to say I'm the daylight because he lit the entire planet for four days before the sun was created. So therefore that actually means, I'm going back to John 1 and 1. That actually means that when God said, let there be light, and John backed it up and said in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God, then that means when God said out of his mouth, his word, let there be light, the future Christ, was spoken 
Because Jesus said, I am that daylight. And when God said, let there be light, then John said, oh, by the way, in the beginning, when it all started, like Moses said, was the word. But before he was the word, he actually was with God. He was the word 2,000 years ago. But for 4,000 years, he actually was with God. Before he was with God, he actually was God because he was in here right now. He was inside of God. So when God said, let there be light, he spoke the future Christ into existence. That's why in verse three he says, let there be light, and there was light. The verse four says, and God saw the light, et, and it was good. God saw the light that he spoke out of his mouth, et, olive top, and he knew that everything that you will ever need, he just spoke into existence. Everything you could ever believe for, everything that's ever gonna happen, he just spoke out of his mouth. That's why he said that the light was good. Somebody give him praise and honor and everything. <laughs> Whoo! I'm a working on it. <laughs> I promised myself I wouldn't preach as long as I did last night. And I'm gonna stick to it. Hey, easy now. Submerge Satan right now. Down. That's right. We picked on each other in high school. We were in the same class. She would not have graduated if she hadn't cheated off me, just so you don't know that. It's not true. It's not true. It's not true. It's not true. But David Flippo did cheat off me, but that's another story. No matter what you believe about creation, you have to believe it by faith. Because none of us was there. So you either believe that nothing times nothing equals everything or nothing times God equals everything. You wanna talk about family and unity? In the beginning was the word, or was with God, and the word was God, because he was in God. When God said that to be light, he was with God for 4,000 years. And then the word became the word in the Bethlehem manger. And now, if you go to St. John chapter number one and verse two, it says the same was in the beginning. I'm, I'm, I'm trying to land this plane, so hang with me. Uh, verse uh, chapter, uh, St. John one, and I'll do uh, two and three and four. And I'm gonna quit, watch. In the beginning was the word, the word was with God, and the word was God, and the same was in the beginning. But look at verse three. Here's what's crazy. In verse three, the was, goes from a negative verb to a positive verb. And it says, all things were made by him. Everything that was made after the beginning, all things were made by him and without him was not anything made that was made from, from the beginning. But then in verse four, John goes back to the negative Greek verb. And in verse four it says, and in, I want y'all to see it, and in him, come on, there it is. In him was life. In him was, look, look, look at me, look at me. In him, here's the beginning. In him was life, and life was the light of men. Two years ago, this past spring, this past March, scientists released, you can look it up, you got the Google machine, go look it up, okay? Scientists released a video of nine unfertilized eggs from the womb of a woman. Now come on, you're an adult, hang in there, you, you can handle this. And they impregnated all nine of those eggs with a sperm cell under a microscope. Now here's what's great, go look it up, it's astounding. 40 seconds on all nine of them exactly 40 seconds, which is the number of probation in the Bible. Exactly 40 seconds after the sperm cell impregnated each egg on the microscope, there's a spark of light. And you got these left wing fruitcake, Nancy Pelosi, Maxine Waters, and the air conditioned lady. What's your name, AC? Hey, whatever it is. 
I call her air conditioned lady because she's full of hot air and she's cold hearted. All right? <laughs> Ain't she a sharp one? <laughs> My graduate wages are from Milner University. Yeah, and I bet you're one of their prized pupils, aren't you, baby? All right. This left wing woke nutcase that's now saying that life does not begin at conception was disproved two years ago. Life does begin at conception. Now watch. A study, scientific study, this year concluded over a four-year period and they studied women and their DNA and they found out that all women has foreign DNA in their body, all women. And they were stumped for a little while because some of the women said they had had children, but some of the women did not put down that they had children. And when they went back and began to ask them, those who said they didn't have children had either had an abortion or a miscarriage. So the child that any woman carries, the DNA remains in the mother for life. You want to talk about a mother's intuition? That's how she knows. Because part of you is inside of her. Now listen, God's a forgiving God. If you've gone through, ma'am, if you've gone through abortion, God don't hate you. And that baby that you were misled to abort is in the presence of God. And you will see that child again. Okay? So don't beat yourself over the head with that. Just go and sin no more. That's what it says. Boy, I'm talking to somebody right here right now. See, God ain't mad at you. God don't hate you. See, when I grew up in church, that's, he hated me. He did. I was it. There's a bus in the parking lot every Sunday that was taking the load to hell every week and I had to drive. It was every week. Oh, y'all so spiritual. If you wasn't raised like that, you've lived a precious life. It's one of the toughest things you'll ever get over spiritually is a Bible Belt Arkansas Pentecostal church raising. That's tough to get over. God's not mad at you. Look, I'm trying to land my plane. Hold on a minute. Thank you, wife. I appreciate it. I'm expecting you to give an offering here in a little bit. All right. If you, I'll give you something that'll look good. All right, see, watch. It's okay to have fun. Yeah. Amen. God, why you don't go to church? It ain't no fun. I don't know why people don't come to our church. I do. You got a mirror? God's sakes. You got enough trouble with life. They sure don't need the hassle of church. <laughs> you know, I win more people on one-on-one -on -one to God in the gym than I ever have one-on-one -on -one in church. Yeah. Now, I've given all to call and hundreds come. I'm talking about one-on-one. -on -one. I've literally had young men, young women walk up to me in a gym. Excuse me, sir. Yeah. Can I talk to you? Sure. What is it about you? I, I'm, I'm God's man of faith and power. Doctor, no, uh -uh. I don't do none of that. And the way I'm dressed, you wouldn't think I was a preacher at all. Yeah, string tank. Yeah, got shorts on, make Richard Simmons blush. <laughs> I don't think a preacher ought to dress like that, but I don't think a Christian ought to gossip either, so there you go. I literally was standing talking to a preacher the other day, a couple months ago. He's over this and he got all mad at me and he said, I just don't think a preacher ought to conduct yourself like you do. I looked at him and I said, well, I don't think a preacher ought to weigh 350 pounds either. His face turned red. Don't know me. He started it. Stand up and tell people to quit drinking and quit smoking and quit doing drugs when you're eating yourself to the grave. Well, I lost my shouts. Had a good sermon going to shot her in the foot right there at the end. You want to be big? Be big. I don't care. Ain't nothing to me. I just don't want to be that way. Why? Because I'm really vain. You know, you know, there'll never be a scandal revealed on me because I tell everything I know. It's okay. Look at me, and I'm closing. 
God ain't mad at you. His DNA is in you. His breath is in you. And then when you receive the blood of Jesus, his spirit comes inside of you. Son, I'm telling you, and you know that your words are powerful, and what you say, you can speak into existence. You want to talk about family day? Welcome to the family of God. Well, I messed up. And? <laughs> Somebody said to me, Dr. Caldwell, do you ever sin? You talking about this week? <laughs> huh? Yeah. Oh, listen, I got, I got trouble. I try my best. I try to live for Jesus. Sometimes I just snap, especially in traffic. I can't take it. <laughs> Ignorance drives me around the bend. I can't take it. I literally was checking in a hotel at 1.30 in the morning, and a guy behind the counter couldn't find my reservation. And I've driven nine hours. I told him what my name was, and he typed it in. Can't find it. I told him again, he typed it in, can't find it. And then he looks at me, and he says, and I quote, my son Devin was standing right there, and I quote, it's 1.30 in the morning. And he says to me, would you have booked it under another name? <laughs> oh, why in the name of God, sir, would I do that? I've got an idea. I'm going to be at 1.30 in the morning. Let's confuse him. Let's book it under zippity doo dah. Try that. <laughs> no. It's not our name. My name. And seven times I told him my name. So I'm not leaving a spot till you find it. And I spelled it out for him letter by letter. And the seventh time he goes, oh, there it is. Ha, 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 ha. <laughs> See, that's my issue. Ignorance causes me to lose my angelic sweetness. <laughs> I can't take it. You see, there's no excuse for ignorance. You got an iPhone with Siri on it, ask it. Well, I don't know, we'll find out. <laughs> Sorry, picture myself on my phone. <laughs> ah, <that's>, uh, <laughs> I encourage myself in the Lord. I get up every day and look at myself and go, it's a good looking man right there. <laughs> you don't have to think so, as long as I think so. Yeah. See, look here. My wife loves me. My kids love me. My mother was crazy about me. My grandchildren adore me. And I like me, and God likes me. So what you think just became irrelevant, didn't it? Yeah. So... So I'm done, I'm done, watch, watch. If you study the word of God and you'll just read, I don't understand it. I didn't say understand it. I said, read it, because you listen to me. And I told him last night, and it bears repeating here right now, okay? That was given to me almost two decades ago by an 87-year-old woman from Yugoslavia, which was before the USSR, but Yugoslavia. And that was given to her mother when she was born in the hospital as a gift for a baby girl. And she came up to me and said, I don't have anything to give. I want you to have this. You can't purchase that from me. That, has, that is priceless. Sorry, it's just right there. See, there's things that you have to understand that you cannot put a dollar amount on. See, well, listen, I'm, I'm done, I promise. Go to the music so they'll be encouraged. Just go. Okay. Watch. And I promise I'm going to quit. Watch. There's a difference between value and cost. I could go over, and this is a bottle of uh, a bottle of oil, olive oil, I would guess. See how much did that cost? Probably two dollars. No, no, no. Look at me. 
That's the value of it. That's how much you purchased it for. If you want to know how much it cost, you have to go ask the olive. And there are things in your life that you're here today that cost you so much. And sometimes you sit and wonder, was it worth it? I got good news for you. Jesus said, no man has given up house, land, mother, father, no kind of anything on earth that it will not be given to him or her manifold in this life and in the one to come. Don't you listen to me. It doesn't matter. Today has been very difficult. You didn't see it, but it's very difficult on me today to stand here and preach for many reasons. Now I could go into my friend, Harrison Cohen, the Jewish friend of mine that died a week ago Saturday. 30 years we've done Israel together. He just died, tore my heart out. So I pushed that out of my head. But it's difficult for me to preach today about family because this I can't push out of my head. Sitting right here is my nephew and my sister who was away from God. I can't tell you. I give up. I said, I don't get it. I give up. She went through stuff in her life nobody should have to go through. Justin, I seen him come in today and I told him, I said, putting on weight. Yeah, I'm getting a little fat. I said, leave it on. I like it. I've seen that boy look like walking death and leave a family get together and cry and go, God, I don't get it. We were all raised in the same house. Harold and Lois, they done the best they could with the information they had. That's it. And sitting here today preaching about family, Renee reached over before I came up here. Not knowing what it was doing to me to preach here today about family. And she said, oh, I wish Harold and Lois could see this. I said, they can. They can. I remember when Terry, my brother, away from God. Mom and dad prayed so hard. 1988, he made a change. See, it doesn't matter how far away from God they may be or you may be. Listen to me. You can't do anything to cause God not love you. Now people will turn away. It hurts. But I can tell you something. He stands with open arms, saying, come unto me, all you that labor and heavy laden, and I'll give you rest. And you know, sometimes it's tough to preach in this town because I know stuff I've done in this town when I was a teenager. And I have to shake that out of my head because I've got a call of God on my life to spread the gospel. And I have preached on six out of seven continents. I can't tell you why. We're from Cozy Home up by Marshall, Harriet. We lived so far back in the sticks, you had to drive toward town to go hunting. <laughs> Man, Dean tell people we was 15 year old before we knew that pneumonia started with a P. I see some of y'all just learned something. And then I sat in the president's home of Israel and he asked me my opinion. And I walk out and I leave. God, I don't get it. But thank you for trusting me. Did it cost a lot to get here? You have no idea. People that were friends turned away. 
ridiculed, lied to, lied about, lied on. But I'm still here. Because once you understand the bond of unity in the family of God, it's a cord that cannot be broken. So, I love you. I mean, I don't even know you. I love you. You may never want to go to church again. But there's coming a day that we're all going to stand before him. And you messed up and walked into a church building. Now you know. You're without excuse. So on that day, you can't point your finger at me and say, I didn't tell you. I told you. Oh, I'm crazy. I got it. Because I don't want you always got to cut up in the pulpit. Well, trying to keep my comedy routine fresh. In case this preaching thing don't work out, I can go to Vegas. It's okay. Jesus did laugh. He did love life. Now, if you want to be sour, that's your business. But I'm telling you today, as a part of the family of God, you can have a joy and a peace that passes all understanding. Just drive down the road in the presence of God, blowing the truck. Not a song, not a sad story. Just feel the presence of God. And people will come up to you and say, what is it about you? You know what I tell them when they ask me that? Oh, I just love life, man. Just love life. And people will call, well, love us the world too much. Well, God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son, so I guess it's okay. See, be careful and not judge a man's harvest until you've seen his seed. If you don't know what it costs somebody, watch your mouth. But here today, bow your heads. Father, I thank you for this packed building of people. And listen to an old wild boy preach the gospel with the gifting that you gave me. Lord, I want you to talk to them. Talk to them. Lord, we don't point anybody out or try to embarrass or none of that. You said, they that hunger and thirst after rightness shall be filled. So speak to them here today. Let them know we're not perfect, Lord. We all make mistakes, and if we fall down, just get up. All people will talk and ridicule, but you're standing with open arms loving. And those people that talk and ridicule, they don't get to judge on that day, you do. So Lord, speak to them here today. As you said here, and I don't really, and I, I know, and I'm with Brother Jim, I very rarely ever have people bow their heads, ever. But I really felt impressed because I, I know the area, I know the people, and I want you to bow your heads. And you don't have to move anything, but right where you're sitting, you say, Preacher, today, God has spoke to me and convicted me either to get right, to get closer, whatever it is. I have felt a drawing to the family of God today. I just quickly, I want you to just slip up. You don't have to go very high. Just let me see it real quick. So I feel, thank you, thank you. Thank you. Others. I'm just going to thank you back there. I saw it. You don't have to go high in the sky. I see you. Anybody else? Anybody else? Preacher, I'm not right. Not where I need to be. Pray for me. I want to get right. Not what man's idea is. Good Lord, if I live a man's idea, I'd never be where I'm at in life. Anybody anywhere? All right, there's nothing. Thank you. Father, you've seen these seven, eight hands, Lord. I'm asking you to touch them before they leave here. Speak to them. Before they lay down tonight, let them speak to you. And get things right. Lord, let them know you ain't got to live by some crazy, religious, theological, denominational bondage. You don't have to do that. We just walk in your light. And you said you'd help us. Help them today. 
in Jesus' wonderful name. Amen. Would you give the Lord a hand clap of praise today? Now before we dismiss you, and I want to go on record, it's before 12. See? And listen, you want to, you want to see modern day miracles? You just visited one right here. Trust my secretary, amen. Really? Seriously? Vicki and Terry back here in the cheap seats, amen. Ain't said nothing the whole service. You gonna amen that? That's fine. See, watch. Look. Pastor's gonna come. Don't you listen to me. I don't give nobody silly ideas. I'm good. I'm good. God's blessed me and my family. Pastor's gonna come. He told me he was going to. He's gonna receive an offering. Look at me. If you don't feel impressed to do something, please don't. Please don't. Okay? I don't want, I don't want anybody to get a bad taste in your mouth or whatever. I'm good. God's blessed me. Sound to me like you're bragging on God. I am. That's what I'm doing. God's blessed me. I really am. And I bless the nation of Israel. That's why I'm blessed. So pastor says he's going to do it. Look at me. If you feel impressed to give, you do it. If don't, please put your money up. Please. I'm good. I'm good. But I refuse to not give people an opportunity to give. You don't have to. But I can't not give you an opportunity. Okay, and I can give you scriptures where that's wrong to not give people a, 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 a chance. So I love you. I hope you learned something today. I hope you had fun because I had a stinking blast. And if they kick me out of the ministry, I'll see you in Vegas. <laughs> give the Lord a hand clap of praise. Come on, Pastor. Bless you, brother. Yes, sir. He was probably outside when I said a while ago, if you have to give to the ministry of Randy Caldwell, put it in the offering plate. But what I'm going to do, I'm going to, perhaps you wasn't in here when did I said that, and perhaps you still want to do that. I'm gonna ask if the ushers will go at the back door back here, would you go at the back door? And when they leave, if you didn't have that opportunity to do that, you will let you do that then. I want to say to every family member that is here today that invited your family to be with us. This day means a lot to me because about two years ago, two and a half, I started texting people and I made it a special effort to have all of my family on my text list by the end of last year. So all of my family that is here today probably get a text from me every day because family is important to me and I love my family. My family, God bless you for having faith in this old man to be the spiritual leader of our family. And I pray too that you are the spiritual leader of your family as well. As we leave, I want you to remember tonight, Randy will be scribbling some more on the chalkboard. Service will begin at 5.30. So if you can come out and listen, I'd like to listen to Randy again this afternoon. He will bless your heart with the knowledge that he has. I'm going to allow the singers to take us out of here. God bless you and thank you for coming today. I'll be we're greeting you as you go out the door. God bless you and thank you. By your grace I have hope You've already paid every debt I owe Please take my chain and make me see By your grace I've been set free